Good morning to everyone connecting from BC. Good afternoon to our panelists connecting from the Eastern Canada and Europe. Warm welcome to the webinar, What You Need to Know to Export BC Grown Cherries to the EU and uh, UK Markets. My name is Ganna Drost. I am manager in the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch, BC Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. I'm joined today by my colleague, Benjamin Kaliznik, Senior Manager in the same branch, who will be assisting us with the tech and Q&A session. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from the territories of the Likwangan speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Sungis First Nations. And I'm thankful you're able to attend today from the territories and communities in which you live, work and play. Our today's webinar will focus on the export requirements for, cherry, uh, for cherries grown in BC and shipped to the European Union and British markets for the current season. We are very fortunate to be joined today by several experts in the field from the several uh, federal government departments as well as trade commissioners on the ground. I'll do a quick intro now. Kara Smith, Acting Deputy Director at the International Affairs Branch, Market Access Secretariat. Charlene Green, Horticulture Market Access Specialist with Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Lynn Fortine, Agricultural Counselor at the Canadian uh, Mission to the European Union. Yannick Daly, Trade Commissioner at the Embassy of Canada to France. And Paul Enverikove, uh, Senior Policy Analyst with, pay, uh, with Pest Management Regulatory Agency of Canada. Dear panelists, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule today for joining this session. So before, uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to go over the agenda uh, uh, and a few housekeeping items. So the webinar will last approximately one hour and uh, there will be three presentations. Uh, we will start with a short intro uh, into the, Can into, into the Canada-European Union free trade agreement and why the EU-UK markets matter for BC cherry industry. Uh, we'll then move to a quick presentation on the past of concerns for uh, the EU and uh, systems approach before we dive into the details of maximum residue limits for the European and uh, UK uh, markets. So these three presentations will be delivered by Cara, Charlene, and I, and will last approximately 30 minutes. Uh, we have reserved 30 minutes for Q&A session after presentations. And uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to raise questions. And you may ask those uh, throughout the event. Please be as specific as you can, and if possible, uh, also indicate who you are directing your question to. Uh, Yannick from the Embassy of Canada to France uh, can be with us until for, uh, until 9.40 Pacific time. Uh, so we'll give him a chance to go first. So the session will be uh, recorded and presentations will be made available in a post event email. And if you experience problems with audio or other technical issues, please send an, a message uh, using the, the chat function below uh, and direct it either uh, to Ben uh, or myself. So uh, let's uh, start with the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, CETA. And uh, CETA is Canada's most ambitious uh, trade agreement and it covers a lot of sectors and aspects of trade. It eliminates uh, trade barriers between uh, Canada and the European Union. Uh, so the EU is the world's largest single market and largest integrated economy. Uh, it is market of approximately 440 million consumers and accounts for over $25 trillion in GDP. CETA has been provisionally in force uh, since September 2017. And what this means is that most of the agreement, about 95%, is in effect. Canada and the EU will bring CETA into full force once each EU member ratifies it. So far, 15 out of 27 EU member states have ratified it. So um, the EU is a valuable market for BC cherries and a number of BC exporters have taken advantage of it in the recent years. And the value of BC cherry export to the EU varied from 1.5 to over $2 million per year since the CETA entry into force. 
So CETA uh, helps to increase the uh, exports of BC cherries and makes them cheaper in the EU market by eliminating the ad valorem component of customs tariffs. Canadian cherries are subject to minimum entry price per 100 uh, kilos only if their price is lower uh, than the minimum entry price set out, set out by the uh, EU authorities that varies by season. Uh, to claim the preferential tariff under the CETA, it is important to certify the Canadian origin of your cherries. And you can see the specific wording on this slide with the phrase that the exporter uh, of the product is covered uh, by this document. So uh, there are some caveats and CETA of course is not a magic wand to all trade issues. Uh, for example, the process of recognition uh, of general, uh, of regional conditions for plant pests under the CETA is still not finalized and will be agreed at a later date, at least when it comes to cherries. And uh, also CETA does not regulate the uh, control of pesticide residues in plant uh, product intended for human consumption. But I'll stop here and let Charlene and Carla uh, and Cara um, tell you more about it. So I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things uh, on the UK market. Uh, you might have heard uh, that the uh, United Kingdom left the European Union um, at the uh, and the CETA st stopped applying to the UK market since January 1st this year. Um, but since April 1st, trade continuity agreement between Canada and the UK entered into force. And uh, this trade continuity agreement is not a new uh, and not, not a brand new trade agreement and it essentially rolls over CETA's benefits. And it, this role, its role is to maintain um, the CETA benefit while Canada and the UK negotiate uh, a new proper trade agreement. So what does the Brexit uh, mean for BC cherries? Well, it also means that there are no tariffs on cherries, which is a good thing. Uh, the rules of origin provisions are the same as under the CETA, but you need to fill in an origin declaration instead of the CETA certificate of origin. And you can follow the, the embedded link in the presentation to, to find out more. So from January 1st, 2021, uh, an independent pesticides regulatory regime is in operation in Great Britain, which is England, Scotland and Wales. And the new decisions taken under the EU regime will no longer apply uh, in Great Britain. And this includes the active substances and maximum residue level uh, decisions and any new uh, EU plant protection products uh, legislation. And it is important to note that uh, the Great Britain sets MRLs based on their own assessment, but uh, all existing EU MRLs remain valid until they are amended. So um, last but not least, here is the website uh, where you can contact the single window agri-food trade services and ask to address market issues or barriers that block your products from certain markets. Uh, you can also get the information about latest sanitary and phytosanitary measures, tariffs, labeling requirements, and other similar rules that can affect your potential export of Canadian uh, cherries to, uh, to other markets. And you might also think that uh, others probably experience already the same barrier and have already raised it, but that's not necessarily, necessarily true. And the uh, government wants to get the additional information uh, from you, the additional details, and to know that there are more businesses that affect it. So we strongly encourage you to, to use this uh, service. And here is my last uh, slide with the, with the contact details. Um, and if you only take one thing away from this presentation, I hope that if you have any questions about the CETA or Canada-UK trade agreement or any other Canada uh, trade agreements or how to use them, you can get in touch with us. And uh, we also have managers for agri-food in our division, Adriana and Sebastian, who will be happy to, to assist you uh, should you have any questions or interest in specific markets. And you'll find their contact details on this slide as well. So with this, I now pass it over to Charlene Green from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for, for her update. Charlene, over to you. Thank you, Ghana. Okay, if you can go to the next slide. All right, so I'm just going to do a brief overview. I'm not going to get into too many details. Um, 
But the, the pests of concern to the European Union are cherry fruit worm and cherry fruit fly. Um, if you are interested in exporting to the United Kingdom, cherry fruit fly is not a pest of concern. Um, their only pest of concern is cherry fruit worm. And the, uh, the first part of the requirements that both producers and packing houses need to meet is um, they need to register with the CFIA before the growing season by signing and submitting a compliance agreement to the CFIA. And there are also um, specific pest mitigation measures for both growers and packing houses. So um, in the orchards, growers will need to set traps for both pests of concern and monitor those, uh, those traps. And packing houses, the, the mitigation measures include storage and sorting procedures. And all of those requirements are laid out in, in the compliance agreement. And for, um, for the export, a phytosanitary certificate is needed uh, from the CFIA. So next slide, Ghana. And um, because there are specific timeframes where the, the traps need to be placed in the orchard, um, it's a good idea to contact your local CFIA office well in advance of when you would like to export so that they can get you the compliance agreement and also review the requirements um, for, for export. So um, that is the, the best thing you can do is reach out to your local CFIA office, let them know that you're interested, and then they can go over the, the specific requirements and also get you the compliance agreement. Thank you, Donna. Short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, thanks for your quick update on, on this. And uh, with this, I will now pass it over to Kara Smith, uh, Acting Deputy Director at the International Branch with the Market Access Secretariat. So, Kara, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ghana. Getting my screen up here. I presume you can see it now and you'll stop me if you can't. So, good morning. Um, my name is Kara Smith and I am coming to you from Ottawa, Ontario. I work for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the Market Access Secretariat. So, I'm the one who answers those emails when you follow the link that Ghana showed. Um, so, Today, we're talking about the European Union. It is a complex market. Um, the process for setting MRLs is different in the EU than it is in Canada. While you shouldn't concern yourselves with the regulatory process too much, I will try to explain. So as part of the assessment process, the European Union uses a hazard-based criteria to identify and remove pesticides with certain characteristics from the market. In contrast, Canada regulates pesticides based on risk to human health and the environment. This means that the EU automatically bans anything that demonstrates a CMR, which stands for carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, reproductive toxicity, and or endocrine disruption properties. The hazard-based approach does not consider exposure to the pesticide to determine the risk. What this means for growers is that the maximum residue limits, uh, MRLs, set in the EU may not always align with Canadian MRLs set by Health Canada. This means close attention must be paid when using pesticides on products destined for the EU market. As Ghana mentioned, the United Kingdom has since left the European Union, but has adopted all EU sanitary and phytosanitary regulations for the time being. This means that the MRLs for all pesticides authorized in the EU, EU remain the same for exports heading to the UK market. This all being said, exporting to the EU is tricky to navigate and it requires research and planning. The following slides are brief analysis of the Canadian MRLs compared to those in the EU. I've organized them into three categories to help demonstrate products that aren't welcome in the EU ones that need precision and caution, and others that have relatively similar MRLs. And of course, always respecting the prescribed label uses. 
At the end of the day, it's all about the MRL found at the farm gate. So on this slide, you can see a list of products that the EU has effectively banned these products from being used domestically or on food imported into the European Union and the United Kingdom. In many cases, the PMRA has approved the substances to be used sparingly. However, I'll point out that dimethoate, malathion, propiconazole, pyrib pyridabin, um, where there is a large discrepancy between the Canadian MRLs and the European. However, there are some products that the PMRA has authored, authorized for a very specific use that would not affect the farm gate MRL of the fruit. So, for example, car Cassaron uh, is a herbicide that can be used around cherry trees, but only four plus weeks after transplanting. There's no MRL because expected residues from this use are negligible, likely far below 0.01. So this might still be an option for growers with specific breed problems, of course. Um, so I'm not here to necessarily dissuade you from using an active substance that is of value to you. I'm here to encourage you to plan carefully if you've negotiated a contract with an EU importer. This list includes, um, this list includes MRLs where the substance isn't banned in the EU, but the delta between the MRLs for Canada and the EU are quite different. So should you wish to use these substances, and export your product to the EU, we recommend you determine which member states your products will be shipped to in advance and discuss with your EU importer. I'll also add, I'm going through these quickly, but we have a handout to disseminate afterwards with these lists as well. So you can take an, a more in-depth look and then I'm going to discuss how to look it up yourself. So these substances have MRLs in Canada, which are similar to the European Union or lower in many cases. When used properly and according to the label for the domestic market, you have increased confidence that the EU will accept cherries that have been treated with these products. While this list may seem safe, it's necessary to be cautious when products are destined for the EU. Exemptions mean that the product is not regulated for the European Union. However, in most cases, they are in fact regulated in Canada. We always, always recommend double checking the member state's authorization and approved label uses for each product you choose. Easier than following a list is to use the Health Canada online label search or the label app for smartphones. From there, growers can type in the commodity and pest to see what options are available and then cross-reference that with the EU database. Once you know what can and can't be used in Canada, you're going to want to head over to the EU pesticide residue database search the pesticide crop combination, and then compare it to the Canadian MRL set by Health Canada. These links are provided in the information sheet that I just spoke about. If anyone has any questions, today we have an online panel um, consisting of a lot of experts who may be able to answer your questions from the PMRA, CFIA, myself from the Market Access Secretariat, our counselor, uh, agriculture counselor, Lynn, who works in Brussels, and the French Trade Commissioner. Um, highly valuable to this conversation uh, as we've had issues exporting to France in the past. So with that, I will give it back to Ghana and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kara. Thanks for your very comprehensive presentation. Um, and I think we could uh, move to the Q&A session now and see whether we have any any questions that are coming from the audience uh, or the questions that were submitted during the registration process. Um, and I hand it over to Ben to walk us through any concerns that were raised. Ben? Great, hi, thank you. Um, thanks uh, speakers and um, just one reminder that uh, if uh, you have any burning questions, you can still submit them through the, the Q&A portion, uh, the Q&A button, I should say, at the bottom of the uh, screen there. 
Um, so uh, none have come in yet, so I encourage you to use that. And um, I believe you have the option of submitting that anonymously as well. Just uh, thought I would mention that. Um, I uh, will start, I guess, with some of the questions that came in during uh, registration. And um, I'm just going to throw them out there. And, and if, uh, if you feel like um, your position to respond, please do. Uh, so the first question is uh, regarding logistics. And uh, this, this person says that uh, logistics have been very challenging this season uh, for both air freight and sea freight. Uh, unreliable increased costs and overall risks associated are making it harder to export at this moment. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak to that? Well, well, maybe I, I can comment on, on logistics. Well, it's obvious that we, there are less flights from uh, Canada to France and uh, from Canada to uh, Europe in general. Let's say maybe 50%, maybe 30%. Uh, uh, so that's less space available just in terms of freight. Uh, some of these flights also are subject to cancellations when, uh, when there's not enough people in, in the flight. Uh, in, in the recent past, the, the, there's been the, the, the number of people on these flights, I understand, has been very low, uh, something like 10%, 20% of capacity. So this would mean more freight uh, uh, available. Uh, so it wouldn't be too bad, but it would be only, so not, not a plane every day, uh, maybe a plane every two days or every three days. So definitely uh, 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 some kind of constraint on the logistical side. Thank you, Danny. Is, is there anyone else who would add anything to that? I, I and I recognize that this may not be in the. Uh, uh, I'll I'll add. I mean, just from a, a general EU perspective, uh, in Brussels, we certainly have not heard that there have been a lot of challenges EU wide, uh, as opposed to you know anywhere else in the world. So I mean, yes, of course. Uh, you know, it's uh, many things have been challenging under COVID, and not the least of which is this. But I would encourage you to to contact uh, my colleagues in Ottawa, certainly uh, via that uh, address that was provided, if you are encountering some specific issues um, in the EU. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I haven't heard of anything specific. I mean, I think the EU, to be honest, like Canada, has been quite responsive um, in terms early on in terms of ensuring that things continued moving. Um, there may be some problems because of Brexit, depending where your product is going in or moving around. Uh, so that's probably a bigger issue, to be honest with you, than, uh, than COVID over the, the, the medium term anyway. So, but if, you, if you're, you are having some issues, please, please let us know. And uh, it's, it's good for us to be aware of those things. Okay, thank you. And um, <clears throat> I guess part of this question was was also, I guess, all, overall the overall risks associated. And um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to ask the uh, the the, um, uh, the asker what you know if they're referring to specific risks with um, you know their product and and maybe just um, uh, you know it being perishable and and you know getting held up at the border or something like that. Um, but if there if you know if there are specific issues or or barriers that you're encountering, I'm sure uh, the speakers would be uh, happy to, to talk to you about that um, if you connect with them after the after the session. Okay, uh, I see a question just came in to uh, the Q&A, um, so I will, I will read through that one. Um, it is, uh, what is the latest news with regard to the labor union related pro problems in the Port of Montreal? Uh, this was a major issue in 2020. Uh, we need that port to be working normally for ocean freight shipments to the EU and the UK. I'm not sure if, uh, if there's anyone here that can respond to that question, but I will just throw it out there just in case. <clears throat> I Honestly, I'm not an expert, but I'll tell you, I thought it had been resolved. That's what I thought I had seen, but that's purely me looking in the media. But I don't know that there's any experts on that on the line currently. The... 
we'd have yeah. to get back to you on that yeah yeah, and for, for the questions that we do not have the immediate answer, uh, Richard, uh, for example, like this one, uh, we'll be happy to, to investigate and to get back to you with the, with the response. Absolutely. Okay, uh, next question is, some MRLs are so low that growers have trouble meeting them. Some plant protection products are not accepted or have strict guidelines. I'm not sure that's a way it's, it, I, I, maybe Cara, you want to speak to that? Um, uh, it is uh, less of a question, I guess, and more of a comment uh, about the situation. I think Paul might be best to respond Paul, okay. to that um, as it has to do with how, how the pesticide is used. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, without having any, uh, any specific examples to, uh, to speak to, um, I mean, we do know that, that there are differences uh, from one jurisdiction to the next uh, with respect to MRLs, um, you know, and, and simply because an MRL is, is lower or higher in one jurisdiction does not necessarily indicate, a, you know, a, a, health, uh, a health concern. Um, you know, when it comes to MRLs that are um, that are higher in in Canada and lower uh, in the uh, in the EU, um, on paper it does uh, it, it may represent uh, you know a barrier uh, to trade, um, but but the EU does have uh, import uh, MRLs, and um, and I know that uh, when it comes to uh, minor uses such as cherries, you know, obtaining import MR, import tolerances uh, might be a little bit more of, of a challenge. Um, but it would be uh, it would be useful uh, for for us as government anyway um, to know to understand to have a better understanding of uh, what particular um, uh, pesticides are of interest or would be of interest to uh, the BC growers um, in order, you know, in order for us to, um, as Kara mentioned, uh, with respect to uh, cross-referencing with the EU, uh, EU database. Um, so, you know, if we had some specific examples, perhaps we might be able to provide a little bit, uh, a little bit more guidance on, on that. Okay, so uh, I jump in? of course, yeah, I jump in. Yeah, um, so so I just want to say that from sort of my seat sitting here in in Brussels and looking at the situation in Europe, I, I just want um, everybody who's anybody who's intending on exporting to the EU to be aware that there is increasingly uh, a call by European consumers for things to be pesticide free. By that they mean chemical pesticides, but pesticide free. So the the commission, and to be honest, regulators, because I suspect that there's also some, some products that you would like to, to see uh, more readily available or, or with a higher MRL in Canada as well, but I'll, I'll just make that assumption. Um, you know, regulators uh, face a lot of pressure uh, to respond to, to those consumer demands, which then become political demands via elected officials. I do think certainly uh, in Canada um, and in, in, in the EU as well, uh, regulators have, have looked at the science and they do make their decisions based on, on what science that they have in front of them. Um, in the EU in particular, where things get difficult is um, at the political level. So if there are products that you uh, feel are absolutely necessary in Canada um, and that would um, make it impossible uh, for you to, to successfully grow your, your, your crop, your product, your, your fruit, um, I, I agree. I mean, please, please raise it with us because those are the kinds of examples that we are looking um, to put forward to the European officials to tell them, look, you know, things are not always the same everywhere. They know that, but we, but we do need to put examples in front of them of, you know, where these things are going to have an impact um, on, on the negative side, because right now, most of what they're hearing are demands from consumers that, you know, everything be clean or pure or whatever it is. So, so that, that's the way I would put it, but yes, we hear you and we agree 
Um, and I just don't want to give you the false illusion that things are going to move in any other direction in the EU anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Uh, all right. The, there was another question in the q and I think uh, Paul is going to look into that one uh, separately, unless, uh, Paul, you want me to address that to the, uh, just to, to let everyone know uh, what, uh, what the question was. Um, if not, I'll move on to uh, the next one in the registration. Do you have a preference there, Paul? Uh, no, no, sure, go ahead. Um, I mean, I don't think I can answer that uh, right this very moment. It'll take some uh, a little bit of digging, but um, but certainly uh, if you if you'd like to, to share it with the group. <clears throat> sure. Okay. So the question was: uh, We have Dan Danitol, uh, Fen Poprath. Patherin, now I'm, now I'm feeling um, uh, sympathetic for, for Cara. Uh, approved for use in cherries this year. Is there any information on EU MRLs for this active? Also with a PHI of 16 days, hand harvesting, mechanically assisted harvesting, will this pose any potential issues in the EU market? And so that's something that uh, Paul is going to uh, to look into. And if there are similar questions, um, please, uh, please, uh, I would encourage you to follow up directly with with Paul. Uh, okay. Um, All right. There... I can just jump in and say that I I checked quickly, and the the MRL in the EU is 0 0.01, which is limit and limit of detection. If that's helpful for right now, but we'll compile a more comprehensive answer um, with your, your question in mind. Thank you, Cara. Uh, okay, I, I see that there were a lot of similar questions during the registration uh, process uh, along these lines. So people with questions and challenges around uh, determining the appropriate PHIs um, based on approved rates, um, or just general comments about how difficult it is to understand uh, the, um, the MRLs and I guess how to choose products based on these MRLs. Is there anything else anyone would like to say uh, to that specific issue? Um, I mean, I would say, honestly, just having that kind of a statement and that kind of information is useful. Um, because yes, I, I, I agree, we, we, I think the uncertainty right now um, causes a lot of, of uh, it creates a, a block in and of itself before um, there's even a product that, that gets stuck at port or that gets hit with non-compliance. Um, and, and you're correct, we need to hear more that there are is situations where exporters or or individuals or companies won't even consider exporting because it's too complicated and there's too much uncertainty. Um, because it's very difficult for us to make that case. We know it's there, we know intuitively that it's there, but then when we get asked, well, nobody's having any problem, so you know, what's the issue? Um, I, I think you know, the more information we have, so thank you for those comments. I think that's that's really helpful. And and just, you know, be, be uh, uh, I guess reassured to a certain extent that, that we are we are aware of that situation in the EU and of that that uncertainty and uh, and you know the the difficulty of following what it is that is going on and what is currently approved and what might be approved in a year from now and what that means. So so we we hear your we hear your voices for sure. If you uh, if you have any I, any suggestions as to how we might help resolve that. I, that would be great, <laughs> but we're certainly uh, doing our best to advocate for you um, on that front. Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> uh, another uh, question that came up a couple times or, or comment uh, um, is, is around uh, the lack of harmonization uh, with, with different MRLs. And um, I think a couple of you have spoken to it already uh, in your presentations or your, your responses. Um, but I just wanted to throw that one out there as well, just to uh, to see if anyone had any other comments on on that. I mean, I think there's others on this panel who are probably more familiar and and work more closely with this on a day-to-day -day basis. But 
I mean, I think from a Government of Canada perspective, what we're seeking is not harmonization uh, of MRLs. I think maybe we, we strive towards having methodologies and, and science and information that, that is somewhat similar so that, you know, we're coming to, to, the, to the same conclusions in the end. Um, but I think what we're looking for is flexibility, to be honest with you, and this is where import tolerances are key. Flexibility to recognize that, you know, there may be different needs uh, in different geographies and different climates. And that, you know, harmonization is not necessarily always the best solution. So depending harmonization where, uh, you know, I, I would say that that's the key. It's the devil's in the details, but sometimes it's actually good to have some some flexibility uh, to allow trade to flow. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Ghana, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there anything around free trade agreements that um, we can say here? Just in terms of, uh, you know, to Lynn's point, not necessarily working toward harmonization, but uh, putting in place rules or, or processes where we may be able to, uh, you know, alleviate some of the, the, the burden that comes with uh, the multiple uh, standards and rules and regulations and things like that uh, across the board. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Ben, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, well, as I've mentioned in my presentation, there are some provisions um, in uh, the in the CETA and uh, there might be some provisions in the Canada uh, UK uh, bilateral trade agreement which will be negotiated uh, that might help uh, facilitate and uh, reduce the the number of trade barriers and reduce the number of duplicative uh, certifications and uh, testings and uh, uh, there are still some provisions that are there, but uh, that need to be agreed uh, and discussed at a later date. So the free trade agreements, they are very much uh, living creatures in that sense. And uh, it takes some time uh, between the, the parties to, to discuss and to agree on, on certain things. But uh, we'll be certainly updating you once uh, there are any, any movements on the files pertaining to cherries and to, to cherry access. Uh, for cherry access to, to the European Union uh, market and any facilitation that happens there. And I just wanted to, uh, to mention a couple of things that um, Yannick, uh, the Trade Commissioner and the Embassy of Canada to France uh, has uh, forwarded us before the webinar. He unfortunately had to leave uh, the session, but uh, he was also saying that uh, he is working on compiling uh, an updated list of French importers of cherries. Uh, and he was encouraging the um, you, the BC exporters uh, of cherries to reach out to your past contacts in, in France to reestablish the, the connections and commercial relations before the, uh, the season starts uh, for, for Canada, uh, since the uh, dimethate uh, does not seem to be a problem this year for, for the French market, since they, uh, there is the, uh, the regulation on the European Union level regarding uh, its uh, MRL. So that's the, the remark that I want to make. Thank you, Ghana. Lynn, I see you have your hand up. Is that uh, new or, or an old hand? No, it is new, but if there's somebody else, sorry, I, I do tend to talk a lot. So if there's anybody else who wants to make a comment, no, I can go ahead. I just wanted to speak to the point of free trade agreements. I mean, free trade agreements do not, what free trade agreements do in, in, in and of themselves is they establish the rules of the game. Um, so when you're talking about tariffs, you can have binding tariffs in an agreement that you bind to zero in an agreement, for example. But you cannot, or nobody, no regulatory authority and, and no government has ever agreed that we should bind regulations in free trade agreements. Why? Because regulations need to be flexible to respond to different circumstances, different situations, new science, new circumstances. For example, nobody knew this COVID virus existed two years ago. Um, so, you know, if, if we had something bound in an FTA that stopped us from, from acting on that, it would be problematic. And so that's why you end up seeing things, and I'll continue my parallel on COVID, where you see this big discussion that's going on now about intellectual property 
and you know what should be done to uh, provide greater access uh, to to uh, the vaccines in different parts of the world. Because what you have are a set of rules on sanitary phytosanitary measures, uh, technical barriers to trade, et cetera, that that look at the behind the border issues, the regulations of which pesticide approvals and MRLs is one. Um, and and what we try to do in the free trade agreements is write in as much flexibility as we can um, for that trade to continue to happen without tying the hands of our regulators uh, so that they're they're unable to ensure appropriate uh, uh, risk management and and safety um, rules, etc. So. I, Ghana's right in the sense that, you know, what you have out of CETA are a series of ongoing committees, bodies, uh, potential regulatory cooperation um, that, that would help us, you know, come closer or come together or have discussions at the technical level with experts in the EU um, to, to try to, to, to diminish some of those gaps or to in, introduce some of that flexibility as trusted partners, because that's really what it comes down to, is how do, you, do Europeans trust our authorities and what they're doing, and do, do we trust European authorities and that they're doing the right things and being safe? The, the, the fundamental issue with the EU, though, is that they tend to take a more precautionary approach than most countries in the world. So this is where you run into a lot of difficulty in the EU because you might you might have two um, assessments by scientific bodies that come up with the same conclusions, but then when you get to the risk management stage, the EU, in in its very legislation, will take a more precautionary or risk averse approach to that product. Um, so so there's there's you know some things that. Uh, take a lot of time because a lot of it is going to be based on, you know, how do we how do we get to the point where we can uh, get the EU to trust that we are in fact um, taking into account uh, the the right things in terms of of risk and and risk management. In the meantime, however, I will repeat again, <laughs> um, there will continue to be for the very near future in the near future many situations where the EU will have uh, higher requirements or lower requirements in this case for MRLs than in Canada. And I think as, as Cara pointed out in her presentation, um, it's really important to prepare yourself uh, to, to be meeting those requirements when you enter the market. Um, for regulatory reasons, yes, because it's the law, but also because your reputation vis-a-vis -vis EU consumers relies on that. Um, whether it's correct or not, that's that's what they believe and that's what they want. Um, so for now, over the short term, certainly, while we continue these discussions through FTAs, um, and and we have fortunately an FTA there to build that to to have those discussions and build that trust, um, I would recommend that you you proceed cautiously <laughs> or with precaution, as the Europeans would say, uh, uh, for anything in that market in particular right now, as it involves chemical pesticides, because that is the, the what I keep calling the new GMO in the EU. This is, this is the dirty word vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, cl closely being followed by deforestation. But don't worry, we don't have that issue in Canada, so we're okay on that front. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to that? No? Okay. Well, I think we are getting near the end of the questions that have come in. Uh, I haven't seen any new ones come in through the, uh, the Q&A box. And um, so maybe I'll just give everyone a chance. We have a little bit of time. So if, if anyone has any final words uh, on the panel, um, this is your time. Is oh. going to be me again? Oh, Paul's got his hand up. Yay. <laughs> Go over to you, Paul. Uh, all right, thanks. I just wanted to mention um, that you know when it comes to when it comes to assessing uh, and uh, registering uh, products, uh, you know, in Canada and and, and elsewhere, um, 
the, the this is really the process is really driven by what the registrants submit um and sometimes you know sometimes the registrants have um you know they have their own uh i don't want to say agenda but they do have uh their own requirements um in terms of how they believe the products need to be used one thing that we as regulators do not always have um access to is once a product is is registered okay so we we receive um based on I mean, based on the, the studies that have been done uh, and the field trials that have, that have been done by the registrants, we review that package. But once, once a product is registered and it is, and it is used, um, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, growers themselves may use the products a little bit differently. Um, they, uh, we're, we're often told by, by growers that, you know, the, the idea is not to use as much pesticide as possible, but the least amount of pesticide as possible. Um, and, and sometimes the use, the real world, uh, use practice information does not necessarily line up with the label. So for example, um, you know, a, a grower might use a lot less of a pesticide uh, that is actually provided for on the label. So, you know, the residues resulting from that use uh, would be a lot lower uh, than the MRL. Um, and, and this is not something that we typically uh, have access to. We might sometimes have it uh, when it comes time for, for reevaluation. Um, so, you know, if, if there is a case where uh, the um, the label use is not necessarily reflected of the real world use. So if you're using a product a lot less than what is provided for on the label, um, it, it might be interesting uh, for for us uh, to know because it may it may in fact you know uh, result in in lower uh, in lower residues and therefore possibly. Um, you know, compliance uh, with MRLs in whatever market you're, uh, you're targeting. And, and Paul, what would be the best way for them to let you know that? So uh, there, are, there are various ways. Um, uh, one of the, obviously, obviously one way is to inform uh, the registrant um, uh, of, of the various uh, various practices. Uh, another way is to contact our uh, info service uh, line at PMRA. Um, that is a sort of an all-encompassing um, uh, call line whenever the, uh, for any kind of uh, pesticide-related issues. So you know that is that is um, the best way to uh, to get in touch directly with us. All right. Thank you. Uh, other final comments? Then. I just I just wanted to add, I see there's a reference to Bryant Christie in the chat. Um, and, and I just want to say we're very familiar with the Bryant Christie studies and uh, both at Agriculture Canada and here in Brussels. And it's definitely something that we, we've used to advocate. Um, so that sort of information is very much something that we, but I'm trying to lower my hand and I keep raising it. Okay, so, so yes. And, and I also completely agree with the comment about um, you know, the BC Cherry Association and various industry associations and, and keeping in touch with them. They will have information. They'll be aware of, you know, what the big, the big issues are and the big things to be careful of. And also your importers, who whatever contacts you have in country where you're thinking of, of exporting, ask them many questions. You will not look stupid. You will look smart because you will look informed and you will look like you know that it's complicated in the EU and that, that you're, you're doing your homework and you're you know, reaching out and making sure that you have all of the details. So, so do not hesitate to ask a lot of questions and to reach out to whoever it is that might be able to help you with that. And the closer to the source, the better. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Cara. I just wanted to plug the market access single window. That window is not only just for the EU, but it's for all geographies that you may export to. So any market access issues you experience, whether it be to the US or China, Japan, um, you can put in your issue or questions into that, that single window and 
um, an operator, so to speak, will get it to the right person on the other side. And there's service standards associated with that single window. So you won't be left waiting uh, in the case of say a stop shipment or a, a serious issue. Thank you, Cara. Paul. Uh, yeah, well, we're still on the call. I, uh, I've been doing a little bit of digging on, the, uh, on uh, Gail's question about uh, Danitol and whether the, uh, the PHI of 16 days uh, would result in any uh, issues with the EU market. So um, because this product was uh, just recently registered, we don't have, uh, we don't have any uh, CFIA monitoring data on it yet. Um, so in terms of real world uh, residues, uh, unfortunately, we can't answer that question uh, yet. So I would err on the side of caution with this one. Thank you, Paul. Okay, there's a, a question that just came into the chat and um, it is uh, earlier, Cara sh shared a way to search for products registered on Cherries. Um, this person spent hours last week going to the PMRA database and reviewing pesticide labels for PHIs and info on whether products were um, registered, required on chairs. Is this an easier app to use? I guess that's for you, Cara. I'll share this with Paul as uh, he's the one who has brought the, the app to light. But from what I can see, yes, the app is much easier to use as you can search sort of by commodity and it pulls up all the, the pesticides that are registered in Canada. Um, Whereas the other way around, you sort of have to search one by one, I think. But Paul is best to share his wisdom and how he quickly. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, there's no easy way uh, to, to do it. Obviously, the label search app is, is probably the, the most user friendly. Um, the website is perhaps a little a little less so, although it does allow you to um, to make the search a little bit more uh, granular, um, but I mean it, it does it does still uh, require uh, some effort to go into every label to uh, to see what uh, to see what they say. Um, but right, but as of as of right now, that is the only way of of uh, of doing a comprehensive. Uh, okay. Um, Charlene, I would not be doing my job as a, a moderator very well if I didn't give you an opportunity to make any final comments you may have. Um, yeah, no final comments from me. I think maybe just echoing um, what Kara said earlier. And, you know, if you have any issues, um, you know, with stop shipments or, you know, market access issues with, um, with any importing country that the, the mass single window is, is a good place to go. So... Thank you. And any other final comments? And I think we've exhausted the questions that have come in. So uh, thank you, Kara, Charlene, Lynn, Yannick, Paul, and Gana. And thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, it's been mentioned several times, but please just follow up uh, at the contact information that uh, you saw in those presentations. Um, and I think you'll probably receive it uh, afterwards as well. Uh, there were a lot of other uh, access points that were mentioned today, and, I, and I'm assuming we'll, we'll send that all out afterwards. Um, you will receive a follow-up email. There will be a link uh, there with the recording uh, of today's webinar. Today's uh, webinar was recorded, and uh, as well as some of the presentations and some, some other helpful resources. And um, there will also be a survey in that, in that email, and uh, you can, we would really appreciate it if you would fill that out and just let us know how, how today's session went and, and how useful it was for you. Uh, so on behalf of the Government of British Columbia uh, and our speakers, thank you for joining us today and, and have a great rest of your day.